Well, I'm almost sorry to have that end. I'll put those, those images because they're nice. Unlike, unlike mine, uh, hers was both interesting and entertaining. But we do have to move along, and so I'll introduce, finally, our commentator. Uh, Jennifer Howell is an assistant professor of French at Illinois State University and the author of The Algerian War in French Language Comics, Postcolonial Memory, History, and Subjectivity, uh, from Lexington Books and in the series After the Empire, the Francophone World in Postcolonial France. Came out last year in 2015. Her research and teaching focuses on Francophone literatures and cultures of the Maghreb and Vietnam. She's particularly interested in how the memory of trauma is transmitted within diasporic communities. And Professor Howell. Soon to be associate professor, hopefully at the end of this year. Um, so before commenting, I want to thank my colleagues for their uh, very interesting contributions. I enjoyed reading your preliminary essays and there were some changes between those and, and your presentations today. So at least for me, having had access to both of them, it's been very enriching. And in particular, I'm actually very delighted to be part of an interdisciplinary panel uniting history and French faculty. Um, so the scholarship presented today demonstrates that we are in effect decolonizing our disciplines and responding in a meaningful way to institutional and societal pressures about the pertinence of studying French history, the French language, and Francophone literatures and cultures today. So to begin, I thought it useful to identify three common threads um, that I will first explain before moving on to more targeted comments and questions for each panelist. So as a caveat, however, I would like to mention that Joel, Chris, and Sandra highlight examples of French colonial culture and France's colonial fracture defined by Nicolas Boncel, Pascal Bonchard, and Sandrine Le Maire that um, both uh, Sandra and uh, Chris both mentioned. So um, French colonial culture refers to the omnipresence of the colonial domain in France, um, starting with the Third Republic um, and uh, up to the present. Um, and then France's colonial fracture refers, uh, on the one hand, to France's failure to adequately integrate colonial history into national history, so viewing them as two separate um, uh, parallel histories, if you will. And on the other, the social, economic, and political repercussions of this failure. So I've derived my comments and questions um, based on these central ideas. So my first uh, common thread is, um, if these papers present and analyze different source material, all question the representation of French colonial empire in specific texts. And this is very broadly a definition of what constitutes a text. So interestingly, the texts elicited belong to categories of Althusser's plurality of ideological state apparatuses. So Chris, for instance, engages with the educational ISA and Sandra and Joel, the cultural ISA and, and quite arguably the uh, communications ISA as well. Although each panelist has explained in depth the discursive mechanisms at work, I wonder if you could reflect more broadly on the role of comics, school books, museum spaces, and exhibits within uh, Althusser's ther theoretical framework, or more generally as um, how these um, work as conventional vectors of memory transmission. And I'm wondering if this perspective will help to discern intended audience and cultural expectations for the unique artifacts you have chosen to study today. And all of you have raised questions related to reception, um, and I think this might be a productive way of at least initially addressing um, this aspect of your projects. Uh, secondly, your analyses also demonstrate that the artists, curators, and educators in question are keenly aware that certain chapters of French colonial history are not discussed for fear of contradicting the dominant class and undermining, in particular, the idea of French republicanism. So the Tarzan exhibit at the Musée du Quai Branly, successive programmatic revisions to the state history curriculum, and Jarry et Ototé's ironic commentary on how history is written are, in many ways, products of and or reaction to Chirac's socio-political engagement regarding national cohesion or what is commonly referred to as le vivre ensemble. So recent events in France have tragically demonstrated that while le vivre ensemble is of course desirable, it remains largely inaccessible. 
Um, so given the nature of the text studied and their surrounding controversies, and here I'm referring to the glossing over of Tarzan's censorship in uh, Boulay's exhibit, um, the disputed purpose of the Musée du Quai Borny more generally, uh, the Levician model for historical narrative, the Bande Dessinée's cultural capital, or perhaps lack thereof, um, the anticlimactic uh, 2007 inauguration of the Cité Nationale de l'Histoire de l'Immigration, and Chris, you mentioned this in, in the earlier version of your paper, and also not to mention the problematic reappropriation of the Palais de la Porte Dorée, originally used in the 1931 colonial exhibition, Et j'en passe, there's many things I could say. But given all of this, how do these texts and contexts conform to or contradict Chirac's vision of the nation and more generally French national meta-narratives? My last general comment is on the commodification of culture collective memory and national history referenced in today's papers. And I was wondering if you would entertain, entertain such a discussion. Um, so Joel, for example, engages with objects, with how objects become museum worthy. Uh, Sandra comments on readership and the Bande Dessinée's market value. And Chris highlights changes made to successive textbook editions by scholastic publishers who, um, from an economic standpoint, are, are very intelligent about uh, anticipating these changes. So as objects circulating amongst consumers who have the power to foster or deter social cohesion, it seems appropriate to discuss how museums, textbooks, and comics participate in the French economy. Um, and so now I'm going to make more um, focused comments on, on the papers in, in their order of appearance. So Joel, your analysis of the 2009 Tarzan exhibit at the Musée du Quai Borny and subsequent discussion of the history of Tarzan in France are quite intriguing because they reveal the extent to which public space and popular culture can reproduce problematic binaries such as self and other, widen the divide between ethics and aesthetics, and even conceal historical error, even despite their best intentions. And ironically, Boulet's fascination with Tarzan ultimately led to a celebration of the simplified Hollywood version that seems to dominate the exhibit, rather than Burroughs' more complex protagonist um, as a more Rousseauian um, uh, character. So perhaps it was Boulet's emphasis on the Americanized Tarzan that resulted in his failure to historically contextualize this figure for visitors. I mean, obviously he's trying to sell an exhibit as well. So failing to mention that Tarzan was affected by the July 16, 1949 law that sought to de-Americanize French popular culture and protect youth from inappropriate material actually served to legitimize and promote uh, the exhibit he curated. Um, since the exhibit also reflects the museum's general Conradian aesthetics, as you mentioned, I was wondering if you would comment more on the ambiguous relationship between Boulet's mise en scène of Tarzan and this earlier example of anti-Americanism with Tarzan at its nexus. And perhaps you can do so by elaborating on a statement um, uh, that you concluded your presentation with. Um, the museum, and, by, and I would say by extension the exhibit itself, can be conceived as part of France's political strategy to remain powerful and relevant in today's post-colonial and globalized world, um, particularly as uh, France wrestles with its colonial past. So how exactly um, does it do this, especially since um, Boulay's, um, sorry, especially how, uh, given Boulay's exhibit and, um, and the fact that Tarzan himself seemed to have ambivalent relationship uh, with American cultural imperialism. Um, and then one thing that I was uh, thinking about, and I've kind of added some ad hoc notes here uh, during your discussion, is uh, interestingly this uh, uh, eight-man uh, physiology, the appearance of Tarzan, um, really kind of points back to this idea of uh, phrenology and scientific racism in earlier periods, um, and how you mentioned that the, the erasure of this naked animalism um, from this exhibit uh, was, um, something that was very interesting to you. And so what's interesting is that um, kind of changing this perception of Tarzan allows for a better or closer reading of a specific space, um, such as Africa, but yet again, we're kind of replacing phrenology with um, Africa as kind of this dark, exotic, scary content, uh, a continent, pardon, and or Africa as a bus stop, that idea. 
Um, so Chris, your current research project uh, greatly overlaps with one of my areas of focus, which is textbook narrative and the creation of a new social consciousness. Um, you highlight recent programmatic changes whose primary goal is to facilitate discussion of socially sensitive questions related to colonialism, slavery, and decolonization. So since your examples primarily come from textbooks, I was wondering if you could comment on the notion of la liberté pédagogique. Um, so according to the French Ministry of Education, educators have instructional freedom. They are not bound to any particular textbook. In fact, they're not required to use one at all. Um, the only requirement for instruction is uh, that they follow the most recent iteration or adhere to the most recent iteration of the state curriculum. Uh, so French historian Sandrine Lemaire believes that while teachers are not obligated to teach directly from their school books, they must first be conditioned to accept new post-colonial approaches to history. Um, and so you mentioned teacher preparation uh, at the very end uh, with the, the, the extracurricular initiatives in Nantes uh, in particular. And I was wondering if you had any um, uh, research or data regarding um, how successful or unsuccessful uh, these initiatives have been in c cultivating new methodologies and, and new sensibilities among teachers and educators. Um, Le Maire also notes that while the history of French Algeria now has a prominent place in secondary school textbooks, um, this moment of French colonial history regrettably eclipses other moments. Um, and so Algeria and the decolonization of Algeria um, kind of come as a stand-in for all other moments of decolonization and colonization. And it occurred to me during your discussion of slavery in particular that um, the presentation of other historical periods such as slavery and the Haitian Revolution are equally problematic in that textbooks limit discussions to, for example, the Atlantic triangular trade, and, and there's really no discussion of the uh, trans-Saharan uh, slave trade, um, or even of, of uh, how the slave trade affected um, the African economy as well. Um, and then also the heroification of various figures such as uh, Toussaint Louverture and Schulcher. Um, and I'm thinking here particularly of Edouard Vissant's uh, comments in Le Discours Entier where he talks about that actually the heroes of um, um, the abolition of slavery are actually the, the Negro Marron, right, that are um, not, uh, that are anonymous um, for, for obvious reasons. Um, and so to, to more, um, to look at um, kind of the, despite these earnest attempts to uncover dark chapters of France's national past, I mean, obviously there are still severe limitations and I was wondering what your thoughts were about that. Um, and, and this also brings to mind uh, the recent Programme 2012, um, which introduced the devoir de mémoire en terminale. Um, and then educators are allowed to uh, explore this question either looking at the Algerian War or World War II. And a lot of educators are still focusing on World War II simply because it's been in the program much longer. Um, but even nomenclature such as the Algerian War kind of limits, it's France's Algerian War, but obviously Algeria has had many wars and not just one that has defined its, its history. And so perhaps just uh, commenting on that. Um, and then, uh, Sandra, um, just a quick note, I was wondering if you could um, e explain more what your definition of comic memory is that uh, Joel mentions in your um, biography. Um, but my first um, kind of overall comment for your, for your, um, your paper relates to uh, postmodern subjectivity. Um, so in Joel's essay, he mentions that the Musée du Quai Borny's exhibit portrayed Tarzan as a complete man, replete with human wisdom and animal strength and therefore in stark contrast to the modern subject who is too often fractured or fragmented. Um, and this is also something that uh, Chris refers to in, 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 in why teaching history and his history pedagogy has to change in France. Um, yet if, as Joe McCormack maintains, schools and, um, oh, sorry, I'm sorry, in your contribution, so you question Jari and Otote's target audience, you know, who might be reading this. Um, so Joe McCormick maintains that schools, and I would say to a lesser degree museums, especially um, since uh, France has the, uh, the first Sunday of every month, museums are free, kind of trying to democratize this, this kind of information. Um, these are some of the last widely shared cultures in what is an increasingly fragmented society. Then comics as popular culture, I would argue, have the potential to reach and affect sectors of the population often excluded by other genres and media regardless of how fragmented that population has actually become. 
And so perhaps with this in mind, <coughs> can you comment more on the series potential sphere of influence? Um, in your analysis of irony in the series, <clears throat> you don't overtly explain the irony surrounding de Gaulle himself. Um, although he is a logical choice for a narrator, and then as I understand it, Mitterrand replaces him at some point in the series, his mythical legacy is a result of her heroification, much like Toussaint Louverture or Chaucer in history textbooks. Um, and de Gaulle is also heroified in many of the, the school textbooks as well. Um, so, for example, uh, James de Lesseur reminds us that de Gaulle came into power after a military coup and not as a result of a democratic election. Right? And so this kind of demystifies the whole de Gaullian experience. And so I was wondering if you could comment more on the artist's choice of narrators for the series. So why specifically de Gaulle and later Mitterrand and not, say, Giscard d'Estaing, Pompidou, Chirac, or others? Um, and finally, you allude to the series' didactive um, objective. And here I would say that um, in the case of, of Joel and, and Chris's paper, also the, the notion of civic objective of museum spaces, exhibits, and also um, uh, secondary education uh, come to mind. So uh, regarding the, the series' didactive objective, so if museums and curricula fail to adequately enlighten students and the public, as both Joel and Chris have, have uh, demonstrated, how does political and historical satire respond to these inadequacies? Um, do the examples explored um, in the other papers lend credence to satire as the form historical narrative should adopt? Um, and so this um, just kind of came to mind to me, especially as you mentioned that the very first album was published in 2006, so a year after the the infamous February 2005 law um, asking textbook publishers to highlight and promote the les effets positifs de la colonisation, uh, for example, in particular in North Africa. So again, I wish to thank my colleagues for such an enriching discussion, um, and I look forward to your responses. Well, I suppose I'll take charge here one, one last time. Um, thank you, uh, Jennifer, for I thought, very thorough, uh, and in particular with mine, largely off-the-cuff comments that, that were very <laughs> recent. <laughs> Since I, I apologized to her before we started this uh, uh, and confessed that the paper that I hurried through today was much different than the draft that I sent to her two weeks ago. Uh, so again, most of her comments, I think, were largely off-the-cuff, but, but I think very, very good. We do still seem to have a few minutes, uh, at, at least, if there's any questions or if we can uh, elucidate anything along the lines of, of what Jennifer's comments were. Oh, and we have a microphone, I think. <laughs> My question is for Sandra Rousseau. I would very much like uh, if you could go back to the referendum picture because uh, for me, the representation of the Algerian is very surprising because especially the female, but I would contend the male as well, would, uh, rep for me, would represent uh, sub-Saharan Africa. So uh, especially in the context of the polemic about veil women in France, I, I was wondering if there is a connection. And also, I would like you to elaborate on the question of readership. D do you have, um, do, do you have uh, data on uh, the success of this uh, petite histoire des colonies françaises? And uh, how about the reception? Yeah, so uh, in terms of reception, I'll start with this because that's the easier uh, <laughs> question to answer. We don't have a sense of who reads it or how many copies are sold because we because the the editors do not release those numbers so we don't know it's very unlikely that it sold a lot and i think most people who bought this are academics it seems to me and that's based on my question to the person who sold me the book <laughs> and i asked him i said oh have you sold a lot of that and he said well no the they are re-editing now a version where the five books are compiled into one 
So that might maybe attract more people, but I'm not sure just because the format itself then is quite daunting because you have, I don't know, so the format is something like this, right? And it would be maybe that thick. And so it kind of turns away people who think of BD as, oh, I'm going to read this for pleasure quickly in the metro, right? It's not something that you could carry with you and just read for, I mean, you could read it for pleasure, but the, the shape of the book kind of, I think, changes the readership also. So, so I'm not quite sure who reads it, really. But as I said in my closing comments, I think it would be really hard for someone who has no clue about colonization whatsoever to understand the text. And actually, the comments that I made about the, the, name, of, the name of Quebec, right? I showed that to one of my colleagues. So it's someone who has a PhD in French and maybe doesn't know much about Quebec because you can't know about everything. And she told me, she's like, oh, is that true? <laughs> And I said, well, no, it's not. But it was hard. it's hard sometimes to tell you know, what's true and what isn't, because you can't know all the details that they're, they're quoting. Um, in terms of representation, I think it's a great question. So most of the Algerians, uh, and the Moroccans actually, are all drawn as Africans. And most, I would say, as the stereotypical sub-Saharan Africans. And I think it's a, a strategy to make sure there's a difference between the first couple of books where they talk about North America and then the last ones where they talk about Africa mainly. There's a little bit about uh, French Indochina and the physical appearance is different also for French Indochina but the spaces are in terms of continent and I think the, the female especially, the female body of the sub-Saharan women is kind of the, the embodiment of Africa in those drawings so you can't quite tell who's whom. There are a couple of pictures where you see veiled women, uh, actually on Algeria, and you see them wearing the aik, but that's a, a moment when they actually discuss the veil. So it's a very specific moment. Um, as I said, the drawings are extremely simplistic, right? So even here, like on this one, this is the, the fifth book, Immigrants. The one on top is the front cover, and this is the back cover, right? And you can tell that the immigrants that are being welcomed in the first picture are actually cleaning their own party at the end, right? So they've become um, people who take care of trash. But you can't quite, you can only identify through shapes. You don't really have clues besides the shapes. And it's kind of the same for Mitterrand and De Gaulle. You can't quite tell the difference between Mitterrand and De Gaulle except for Mitterrand as a hat that's different than De Gaulle's. But that's it. If, if I might actually add to, to what you were suggesting. Uh, in terms of reception and readership, it's really, really very hard with French BDs because the French publishing industry has now adopted the American model of not releasing numbers uh, it, of particular books. They just say what they've sold over the year. And they don't say how they've sold them. They just say that they've given them to, to stores or sold them over to the stores. And they don't, so they, it's very difficult now to track. It used to be easier and you could do 1980s and things like that. But with the shift towards the graphic novel, which is more Anglo, mm -hmm. a more Anglo model of, of the Bay Day, they've adopted the Anglo model of keeping count and not telling people. So that way they can pretend on the one hand that things are exclusive and on the other hand that things are bestsellers. <coughs> I but, would, I'm sorry, sorry I would say that for the ones that are extremely popular, like for example right now, La Rabe du Futur is extremely popular. They've released numbers for oh, that. Of course, yes. Just to prove yes. that, oh, that has sold 200 thousand copies. But they always pull out an exemplar to demonstrate the strength of the industry. Yeah, right? exactly. Uh, on the other end of that, with the representation, I, I think the key was what you said at the very beginning, that the, the irony of this, of it not being limited to elites, while this is obviously for educated people, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and I think it actually is an example of what Bart Beatty has talked about as uh, the, the conversion of popular culture into unpopular culture yeah. in, in Beatty studies mm -hmm. or in Beatty production. Uh, so I, I thought it was brilliant. Please. For, for the, it's right behind you. Thank you. So I have a question for Christopher and then a comment for uh, Sandra. So Christopher, I was wondering if you could speak to the, op speak more to the opposition to this change in educational policy, specifically because as Sandra mentioned at the beginning of her talk, uh, the text that she quotes from related to the Maison de l'Histoire de France is actually advocating for a kind of recuperated, renewed roman national. And Sarkozy in particular is, I mean, in promoting this museum is very opposed 
to this um, fragmentation of memory. And then for Centre, I was wondering if you could speak to, I mean, when we think of Bede, we come to expect this kind of ligne claire, and we, this, this particular this style, and I wonder what are, what are the politics behind choosing a very self-consciously primitivizing style? I mean, what other kinds of comics are these illustrators looking at? And, you know, and how does that mediate the kind of message they want to promote? So um, this chapter is going to address that question in, in part by looking at what I call the No Repentance Gang. I probably won't refer to them that, that way in the book. <laughs> but, uh, uh, and I'm th thinking, I've read the, you know, Alain Finkelkraut, his stuff, and Pascal Bruckner, and then there's some historians who've, um, and I'm going to actually kind of deconstruct the nature of their arguments and how opposed they are to any really serious, comprehensive historical accounting and reject sort of sociological studies uh, that would prove discrimination sort of on an ethno-racial basis. So there is, and there are nationalist historians um, uh, who, who uh, are, op are opposed to this rewriting of, of uh, colonial history. Um, so, uh, and just to, to address, I thought your questions were just excellent, and this shows the, <laughs> you very carefully read the longer version because <laughs> everything I couldn't get, I'm like, yep, okay, I didn't get to that, I didn't get to that. Um, but there were, but the liberté pédagogique sort of is connected to this. There, there was the textbook publishers want to make money, but I was struck, and I based my based unlike Jennifer based my work, particularly on reading the secondary literature on this across <coughs> a number of disciplines. I didn't have time to to do what she's done, given that I was starting in the late 1800s. Um, but um, it's I, I was I was struck by how textbook publishers was, would sometimes get ahead of the curriculum, or there'd be an announced revision, and then it would happen three years later. The 2002 elementary ed re revision was supposed to happen earlier; it happens in 2002. The publishers are busy organizing to to make money. There's the economic imperative, but there are times when publishers, including big name publishers, innovate and um, at, at risk. And so there was a, a Nathan textbook in the late 1930s which was the only textbook to suggest that um, uh, the colonial empire would at some point come to an end. And this led to uh, you know, a, a violent outcry in the, in the press, and I think it, became, it was discussed in the parliament, that this should not, should not be an interpretation that somehow there would be an end point um, uh, that would result in, in independence. In the 1980s, when the Algerian war was integrated into the secondary curriculum, um, I think it was 83, um, immediately an association of Algerian war veterans uh, formed to study all the textbooks that came out and to look at their coverage. So there is not just the politicians, Pompidou basically scuttled uh, reform that was um, uh, uh, in the late 1950s by Brodel, a more civilizational, open um, scholastic history curriculum for Terminal. So you got the big the big politicians who have a view of what national history should be. You've got the education ministry. You've got the textbook publishers. You've got the teachers themselves who are allowed a certain amount of, as you, as you said. And in fact, the scholars that I've, I've looked at point this out. You can't know from what the curriculum guidelines are and what the textbooks say automatically what's happening in the classroom. And I mentioned some teachers, the, the studies show that I've looked at, um, that they avoid the topic because of the emotional responses of the children in multi-ethnic classes to the racism that justified the colonial empire, to the violence, to the inequality. They, they have a hard time adjusting to that, particularly if they have family memories that relate to these you know, very violent episodes, as so many do. Um, so there, there is, there are all sorts of stakeholders. Um, and um, uh, that's why I'm struck by what progress has been made. Because when you consider that they had to overturn, again, I'm simplifying, but about a century worth of a certain vision of the empire, and they, I had, you'd have to nuance that if I had more time, um, the, the sort of post-millennium curricula are a marked difference. Now, the question is, in the current climate, uh, will, will there be a reversal? There, there, there have been, you know, in the past, and there can be, and the Roman national approach that you suggested in the Maison de l'Histoire de France that Sarkozy suggest, you know, wanted to found, that got scuttled immediately once Hollande got... Uh, yeah. 
And uh, so I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've looked into that as well. Um, I don't think I'll be able to address it in the book. But Sarkozy is a fascinating figure because whatever one might think about his, his five years in the presidency, he um, has continually repositioned himself. Um, and so he was in favor of affirmative action à l'américaine. Um, uh, but then he comes into power, he's, but he's got to also get the Front National votes to be elected. So then he's suddenly Maison de l'Histoire de France, but he's also making pronouncements about, you know, uh, uh, black, blacks in France and people of North African descent in France are terribly discriminated against and this isn't right. We don't all start on the same starting line in French society. So this is during the campaign. So he's all over the place and Pascal Simon has suggested that it's the French left has, has created an opening for maybe not a very, very successful president, but a very savvy politician. And that by maintaining the sort of universalist, the constitution bans consideration of race, origin, and religion in differentiating the treatment by the state of, of, of citizens, um, he found an opening. Um, but the moment he needs Front National voters, he shifts course pretty dramatically. And the Maison de l'Histoire de France is a very good example of that. I think very cynical, <laughs> but it served a political purpose. Um, so the political context, the evolving political context is, is crucial because the curricula are written every few years. The teachers are affected. Um, are they gonna be prepared to teach this stuff or not? The, I'll just finish on this. The, the, the uh, comité, uh, it's now called the Comité National de la Mémoire et de l'Histoire de l'Esclavage that was created as, as part of the Taubira Law a few years after the, the law was passed. In 2013, it issued a report. The reports are very interesting and I, I mine them because they analyze the textbooks as well. Um, their view is there's still a real lack of sensitivity training and content preparation for teachers, particularly at the elementary education level. So there have been initiatives, um, but from their point of view, not sufficient so that the students are exposed to this in, a, in an appropriate way. Sure, absolutely. I was just about to say that we need to, probably need to do that. Right. So everyone, thank you very much. Uh, uh, and thanks again to all my